It is indeed time to drain the swamp in Washington, D.C. Decades of failure in Washington and decades of special interest dealing must and will come to an end. Now, Trump said that over and over on the campaign trail, draining the swamp. But when you look at the appointees, looks like not a lot's getting drained. This is what uh, Time Magazine had to say. 11 of his 19 cabinet and cabinet level appointees have sat on the boards of corporations or organizations that have lobbied the federal government, spending a total of $497.5 million. Many of his appointments have given their own money to Republican candidates over the years, totaling about $32 million in his cabinet. And high level appointments include several friends who help finance his very own campaign. That includes his pick for Treasury, Steve Mnuchin. Mnuchin, a hedge fund gazillionaire who was also a Goldman Sachs exec for 17 years. So he's nobody's idea, I think, of the common guy. Mnuchin also raised cash for Trump as his national finance chairman. Now, critics call him the foreclosure king, and that's because he was big wig at one of at one West Bank. That's an institution that got into hot water for trying to kick people out of their homes after the 08 housing bust. Uh, his bank also is accused of harassing an 89 year old woman while trying to foreclose. Mnuchin denied those claims during his hearings today. In the press, it has been said that I ran a foreclosure machine. This is not an accurate description of my role at One West Bank. I ran a loan modification machine. Okay, let me bring in our panel right now. Former Democratic New Jersey Congressman Steve Rothman. To his left, Dominic Carter, political journalist and author. And Jerry McKinstry joins us also, managing director of the November team, a Republican-leaning political consulting group here. All right, um, you know, I don't take issue when, if somebody wants to put um, in position, certainly in the financial sector or of Treasury, et cetera, people with some business experience. I do think people overestimate that if a CEO comes in, it's not without precedent, certainly in American government, it's not the same thing. You can't hire and fire everybody you want. These are government level jobs, et cetera. You can't get bonuses for good uh, performance, et cetera. Okay, that all said, there's a whole lot of folks here. I've, and only because of what Trump himself promised. No lobbyists, I'm looking out for the regular guy. Half of Goldman Sachs is in Washington, it seems. Um, should we be concerned or no? I wouldn't be necessarily concerned that a, a bunch of rich folks are going to be in the cabinet. After all, we had Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. They came from rich homes and they arguably did a wonderful job for the nation's poor and middle class and, and working people. Uh, it's more about the policies that they're going to put through. Uh, what, what disturbs me even more are the number of vacancies that today exist in the national security positions. Uh, most of those positions are vacant. And Mr. Trump is being sworn in as our president mm -hmm. tomorrow. Now, Sean Spicer, um, his press, press sec said that what Democrats are doing to these nominees um, is unprecedented and moreover it's completely not in keeping with how Republicans treated Obama's nominees eight years ago. Between the lip and the cup, is there something to it? Or conversely, you know, a lot of them haven't even filled out their paperwork. I mean, we were talking, you know, with Price, for example, with questionable stock dealings um, that obviously benefited him, trades he made right before he actually, in a regulatory role, at least in a congressional oversight role, was moving ahead a deal here that would certainly benefit his bottom line. Those kind of things have come up. Um, does Spicer have a point, though, that people should be able to pick who they want without harassment from, you know, Democrats in this particular case? Well, one person's harassment is another person's serious questioning to pursue the national interest, the people's <coughs> interest. So, for example, if Trump's appointee to head the EPA is somebody who litigated against all of the rules for clean air and clean right. water and anti-fracking, you want to know about that. Or if Tom, Dr. Tom Price, the Trump's nominee for Health and Human Services, is for privatizing Social Security, Medicare, and cutting Medicaid, you want to know that. Um, Dom, do you get the vibe that, listen, he's defied expectations as Trump throughout the campaign. God knows we've been wrong about him a whole bunch of times. But 
there just seems to be both in the nominee picks how much they were prepped before they got there, how much nominees haven't even been put up. Forget about for the cabinet level <clears throat> positions, so many underneath it. We're hearing reports as well that the outgoing departments haven't even been able to have meetings with their counterparts. They haven't even had people to go over briefings in terms of this is what you're about to inherit, this is how this works, etc. That either they're going to do it all in their own way and they figure this out where predecessors haven't, or they're just not ready. The latter. And, and the first part. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to do it their own way. They've already shown that. Donald Trump, our new president, has shown that. He's going to do it his way. I, I don't know, Richard. I, I just, I have to be honest with you. It's a sad day in America right now if you sit from the seat where I come from. I'm looking at the inauguration ceremonies. I don't see no people of color. None. It, this is the year 2017. Aren't we supposed to be coming together as a country, especially after Obama? Now, he said he would, that yeah, America's yeah, going to come together. Yeah, okay, but with politicians, you can't pay attention to what they say. You got to pay attention to what they do. And I'm looking at a ceremony where I see a, a sea of white, and, and this is on top of what we were talking about earlier. No Latinos thus far in the administration and a cabinet level position since 1988. This is the first time this has happened in 30 years. And, and, and this is our president. Hey, who says you got Ben going Carson. To, what are you complaining right, about? Right, right. We got yeah. Ben Carson. Right. And well, I'm going to leave that one alone. Fair I'm enough. A, I'm going to leave Dr. Carson alone. You know, <laughs> Jerry, um, where do you think Trump goes tomorrow in terms of an address because clearly there's the bombast that a lot of people said oh once he won he's going to go back to what we've seen before clearly no what you had in the campaign is what you're going to have as a president i mean you're with you know the media okay the idea that we'd move the press and they're going to get moved out of the white house we would have thought was inconceivable the idea that he's going to tweet instead of press conference or anything else now he's not going to do that we're accepting or just acknowledging new realities seemingly by the day. Will his message tomorrow, do you think, be one of, let's, you know, let's breach divides here, let's all come together, or is it, I won, you didn't, I'm a winner, you're a loser? Where, where do you think he goes? All right, well, if I was advising him, and clearly I'm not, I would advise him to be, to have a unifying message, to have a really inspirational message and say, let's put this campaign behind us. Um, don't forget who got you here, but inspire, inspire, inspire. Do your best. Talk about the economy. Talk about... Did you tamp down expectations? Because he seemed, at least from what that little thing is, everybody's going to do awesome. We'll be better well, than ever before in the history of this country here. Um, and if it rains, I'll part the heavens, you know? He will never tamp down expectations. I don't expect That's to see That's dangerous a little bit, isn't it? You know, I, I Maybe think, not. I don't know. I, you know, <laughs> I, it's, it's all historic. It's all, I think we're all going through this for the first time. And it's fascinating and it's interesting. And the thing about it, though, is that this is all going to change. Yeah. Day two is going to be different from but, day but one. But can I tell you, we all said the same thing in different ways. And I'm sure you folks at home felt the same way. There are moments where, I don't care where you are politically, where you say, oh my God, this is real. This is really happening. Like you said, he gets off uh, you know, the jet with the U.S. president on the side here and say, oh my God, he's the president. Today when I heard him talk again, I forgot. I'm like, he's really going to be present. Tomorrow, this is all real. So with that, um, what kind of a president is Donald Trump? Well, maybe his negotiating style um, is something that may work here. He says he is the world's best negotiator. Just ask him. His style and strategy in business, could it cause problems when it comes to international relations? Or um, is this something maybe we need right now where there is some interaction? I'll ask the panel and certainly the guy who knows foreign relations at the table right after this.